I'm Francine Love. I'm an out boss and the founder and managing attorney of Love Law Firm. Hello, Out Bosses. Rhodes Perry here, and welcome to this week's episode of The Out Entrepreneur, a weekly podcast where I get to interview today's most inspiring LGBTQ bosses crushing it in business. And on this week's episode, we are welcoming Francine Love, joining us from Long Island, New York. Francine, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rhodes. It's a pleasure to get to be with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm very, very excited to, to talk more about your entrepreneurial journey and your business. And I wanted to just introduce you to the audience a little bit more. So if you'll allow me, I'd I'd love to just kind of read through your bio really quickly. So after 24 years of corporate life, including six years with a startup, Francine pursued a lifelong dream of opening her own law firm. And in 2015, she began her entrepreneurial journey starting Love Law Firm, which serves entrepreneurs and businesses of all sizes. When she's not busy running her law firm, Francine also serves as the founder and ED of the Long Island Business Forum, which is an organization helping businesses thrive while benefiting the greater communities of New York City. So there's a lot in there, Francine, and I'm excited to really unpack all of the good work that you're doing in the world of law and especially helping small business owners, many of whom tune into this show. So why don't you kick us off and just tell us a little bit more about your business and what makes it unique? Sure. Well, I find that Many of the law firms that I grew up in and was around don't really value uh, small businesses. They're always looking for a really big company with a lot of employees and a lot of money, and, and that's the score that they keep going after. I found that the people I love working with are the business owners who are either emerging or they're small and medium-sized businesses, they're solo entrepreneurs. Because they have a lot of interesting things happening. It's just a market that I felt was underserved. And so I just jumped two feet in and started running about three years ago and have absolutely loved it ever since. My law firm focuses on uh, the emerging small, medium-sized businesses, and we love it. Uh, that's really fantastic that you're providing this service uh, to small businesses, you know, like I said, many, many of whom business owners that listen to this show have either a solopreneur enterprise or just a small team. And so I'm curious, like, what Mm -hmm. are some of the things that you think small business owners ought to know about the law when they're, when they're just getting started? Well, when they're just getting started, one of the things I spend a lot of time counseling my clients and people who come to me on is, should you have a business entity? So many people, when they're beginning their entrepreneurial journey, do it as uh, sole proprietors. And that's an area that I try to steer my clients away from as quickly as possible. A sole proprietor is where you're just working either out of your home or a small office, and you haven't formed a corporation or a limited liability company or any type of legal entity to protect yourself. And that's the thing that always concerns me, especially for people who are becoming entrepreneurs later in life, where you may have some assets, you have a home, you have some retirement savings, you have cars, you have children's savings account that you want to protect. And in today's world, it's so litigious and people will sue for anything and nothing that if you're going to be out selling a good or a product or a service, you really want to make sure that you've protected you and your family first. And so the first thing I talk to people about is making sure that they put a business entity in place, which acts as that fire barrier between any bad thing that can happen in the entity and in their own personal life. That Thank you for breaking that down. I think that's really helpful. And another kind of basic question that I think you could really help our listeners with is, when you're thinking about that that business structure, that entity of protection, what would you recommend for, I mean, many of the folks that tune into the show are running kind of service-oriented businesses, consulting firms, things of that nature. How would you recommend kind of the LLC path or the S-Core or what are, what are some of those factors that you think business owners could benefit from just from the expertise that you have? Sure. I always hear my clients say, either an LLC or an S-Corp, by and large, they have the same legal protections of a limited liability to you, the owner. 
So you've put up that barrier. In law, we call it a corporate veil. You've put this corporate veil between you and bad things. The the difference between those two is obviously the legal structure. A corporation is a bit more formal. And so when you think of a company, you think of a board of directors, you think of officers of the company, you have a president and a, a treasurer and a secretary. And as we know, you know, companies meet annually, they have uh, board resolutions and things like that. So a S-Corp follows a lot of that same path. They are still a company, so they have to follow those same legal requirements. What an S election is, it's a designation from the IRS, which is that it's the company is going to be called what we call a disregarded entity. And a disregarded entity means that the IRS disregards its income and looks only to the income that the owner or owners of the company receives from that enterprise. And so it avoids what we call double taxation. A big company, say a Best Buy or whatever, they get taxed on their corporate earnings. And then when they pay their CEO and other employees, those employees pay taxes on their income. If you're an S-Corp, you don't pay taxes at the entity level. You only pay tax at the individual level. But you do have these uh, corporate requirements of meetings and elections and minutes and all that you have to follow. An LLC is a bit less formal. In an LLC, you have members. You don't have officers or directors or board members. You can adopt a corporate structure if you want, but you're not required to. And so the members meet, they aren't obligated to meet annually, they're not obligated to take minutes and keep this formality. So it's a bit looser. A lot of entrepreneurs, especially solo entrepreneurs, prefer the LLC because you don't have some of these corporate requirements that you have to adhere to. You still have the protection of your assets and you have the taxation benefit because an LLC also is only taxed at the personal level. It's not taxed at the entity level. So those are the main differences between the two, and hopefully that, that makes sense. That makes great sense. And just one, one follow-up question here, and I get asked this question. I'm like, I'm not a lawyer. I'm going to direct you to people like Francine, like you. So when, when a business like, you know, say someone gets started in a consulting business and they, continue, they start to grow, is there a point that you would recommend as a lawyer going from an LLC to an S core? Uh, is there, you know, is that a pathway? Do you see that um, with the clients that you work with around consulting them around just kind of safeguarding business structure and considering making that switch, or is that advised not to do? You don't really have to do it unless you're you're starting to look at wanting to have a lot of investors. It's very easy to bring investors into an LLC, but The difference there is when we bring them in, we have to add them to the the membership. Sometimes we have to then discuss classes of membership. We we may have to change an operating agreement. So there's a lot of negotiation that takes place when you bring a new owner into an LLC. An S-Corp is different because it's like a company. You can have these stocks. And so you can say to someone, okay, you want to join our company? We're going to sell you shares of stock. And it's very simple. You know, here's the number of uh, shares you're going to buy. This is the price per share. And then they come in and that's the end of it. Now, you may go and have a shareholder agreement, which discusses how all the different owners of the the company are going to vote their shares or if if they're going to be able to sell them to other people outside of that closed group. But, But it's a very simple transaction. So if you that you're going to want to have a lot of investors in your company over time, then an escort would most likely be the way that you want to set up. And, and I would advise then doing it from the beginning because quite frankly, it's a pain mm-hmm. to take down one entity and bring up another. You just incur unnecessary expense. So when I talk to my clients, I get a sense of where they think they're going to be long range, especially with ownership of it. So if they're thinking of having a lot of investors, then we'll be leaning toward an S-Corp more than we'd be leaning toward an LLC to begin with. Okay, this is super helpful. Thank you for walking us through that. I guess this is my final question, at least sure. on, the, on this angle. 
it makes sense to me, you know, uh, if you're anticipating having a lot of investors in your company going that S core route. With that, do you see that more with product based businesses, or have you ever seen that with service based businesses like other law firms that go in that direction? Or yeah, it's funny. I I don't know that I've thought about the distinction before, Rose, but I think you're right. The companies that I've helped do more of the selling equity and bringing other investors in have have all been product oriented rather than service. Yeah. So that's interesting. That hadn't occurred to me before. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, that that totally makes sense. I'm just thinking, you know, out here on the West Coast, I'm thinking of a lot of the tech companies and, you know, a lot of people who start up with the anticipation of selling and, you know, getting a lot of investors Mm -hmm. excited about the thing, you know, the app or whatever the thing is that they're developing. But it's usually, it's it's oftentimes that product-based business. So Mm -hmm. very, very interesting stuff. I, I found this to be really helpful. So I hope other folks are like, yes, taking... Lots of notes because this is totally free legal advice. (laughs) Thank you. I have a question more about you and your your entrepreneurial journey. So can you walk us through like how you got started? You know, I read in your bio, it was a lifelong dream of yours to start your law firm. And you've spent, you know, at least two decades working for someone else on their law firm. So walk us through what that journey looked like and and, and that final moment where you're like, you know what, I'm going to do this now. Sure. Well, I grew up with a father who loved me and believed in me and also showed me episodes of Perry Mason that were on <laughs> reruns uh, when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah. I grew up in San Diego, so it was uh, Channel 11 KTLA, I think it was, that had uh, Perry Mason on in the morning. And we would watch it, and you know, I thought, I could do that. That would be awesome. And my dad always just believed I could do anything and encouraged me. So... I become a lawyer and I went to work at a big law firm for one year. And the motto there was, if you don't come in Saturday, don't bother coming in Sunday. That that sounds fairly miserable. And so I quickly left that. And I actually went to work not for law firms, but for big major Wall Street companies. And I went into in-house legal there. And so that was a little bit better than being in a law firm. And I worked my way through these companies doing all sorts of different things from litigation to employment to privacy to commercial contracts to uh, intellectual property and really got a nice rounded education about how companies work and what's important to making them work. But at a certain point, I I remember very clearly my spouse and I, We'd gotten married, we had adopted our first child, and we had gotten the call that um, we now had a son. And we went to pick him up, and I was managing a litigation that was overseas, and I was working basically 20 hours out of 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And they weren't able to accommodate my request for maternity leave, uh, I guess is a polite way of saying it. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this was silly, that I was killing myself to work for a company that as wonderful as I believe I am and was and all the great work that I was doing for them, if you leave, they're going to replace you, Mm -hmm. right? Good or bad, there's always someone who's going to take your place. But there's no one who can ever replace me and my family. That that was the most important thing to me. And so that was it. I just remember waking up one day going, I won't do this another day to build wealth for someone else. I want to focus on building wealth for my family, for making a home and a life that makes sense for us and building my practice around people that I want to work with. Because I had spent 25 years working with the titans of Wall Street who all you know, think highly of themselves and, you know, some should and some shouldn't, like in every profession. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find people who were really just busting their butt, doing something amazing locally and were making real jobs and providing to the economy here and were, you know, just real people. And that's what I wanted to work with. And thank God that's the practice I have. Yeah. How did it feel when you finally owned that piece of of just saying, I am going to start my own business and build my own wealth and and create this this vision of a law firm that doesn't yet exist? What was that feeling? It was 
that was absolutely terrifying and <laughs> utterly exciting. Yeah, right. It was both, right? Yeah, like, yes. You know, I, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time. You do, Rose. You, you're like, isn't that a common thing? Like, we, oh my God, we. <laughs> yes, it's the, ro- the it's roller awesome. coaster begins, right? <laughs> There is so much good stuff that you just shared. I mean, just leading with the acceptance that you had from your father, right? Who completely believed in you and sat down with you to watch Perry Mason every day. And you had that possibility model of like, I want to do that. I want to be that person. And I think that that mm-hmm. is incredible. So it seems to me like very clearly that you, you had a strong family growing up and family is really key for you. And even this was in your bio, I didn't read this, but I think this is really interesting as a side note of when you got married, which was 10, 10, 10 at 110. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, (laughs) What was, so is that like you decided on that day because of the numbers or are you attached to the, the ones and the zeros or how how did the decision come to do that? You know, we, we decided to get married and we were excited and we said, how soon can we do it? And we looked, I think the decision we made was sometime in September. And I thought, how cool is it? You know, we don't have many of these left, right? There was going to mm-hmm. be 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, 11, 12, 12, 12. Yep. And then that was going to be it, right? Yeah. And I'm like, let's grab this. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and fortunately, she agreed. We got it arranged. I was upset someone else had already gotten 10, 10 in the morning. So I, I agreed that we could do one ten in the afternoon. Nice. But uh, it <laughs> I was love amazing. That. Yeah, I love that. I just think that's really cool. So just like a random aside, <laughs> but I think it's worth noting. So good on y'all for, for <laughs> capturing that day and time. It's very easy to remember. I forget like, my anniversary. I know, <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh, I wish I had that. <laughs> yeah, it's very smart. So you were talking a little bit about the, the culture of, of the employers that you worked for. Not great not great for work life and then the culture that you're envisioning for your law firm and i know you're you're still in your first couple of years you know but can you talk to us a little bit about the intentional culture that you're trying to set up for yourself and for people that you hire or contract out with and then then of course your clients as well like how are you centering that and and just trying to create something slightly different than what you experienced when you worked for other folks well, I'm trying to create a law firm that's incredibly different from any other law firm you encounter. Most of the time when you tell someone that you're an attorney, they're like, oh, and then they don't want to talk to you. Attorneys aren't well known for having great social skills. You know, people tend to think of us as uh, pompous or arrogant or condescending or lots of things. And so Love Law Firm exists to be the antithesis to everything you've ever thought about your lawyer. One of our taglines is, in fact, isn't it time you learn to love your lawyer? Mm -hmm. I had a client call, and she told me that while she was looking for a lawyer, she saw an ad from a guy who said, I'm the sociopath on your side. Oh, my God. (laughs) And I think that's the absolute wrong thing. This world does not need any more sociopaths. We have plenty. Mm -hmm. We don't need them on our side. We need them eradicated. What we need are decent people who are willing to work with one another. And and that's what my law firm strives to be. We're not the legal sharks. You know, you always hear about that, right? The shark. We call ourselves the legal dolphins, right? (laughs) We're the ones that you want to play with. We're the ones you're going to pay money to swim with. We're the ones that are going to, you know, do do bomb diffusing like they've taught some dolphins to do in the Navy, right? Mm. That's what we do. We're not sociopaths. We're not ridiculous. We talk to our clients like people. Many of them are our friends now. And we've created a culture where we tell our clients literally that they're beloved. And we've created a whole beloved program that embraces them and really tries to help them on multiple fronts so that they feel that they have a lawyer that they can pick up the phone and call and ask a question, and the cash register is not running in the background the whole time. Totally. Um, but that they're going to get the help they need. Yeah. So that's, that's what we've tried to create. I, I, love, I love the tagline, you know, isn't it time that you loved your lawyer, and also this kind of visual of, of playing with dolphins. <laughs> I think that that's definitely yeah. disrupting the culture of law firms, right? Do you find with that that you're attracting ideal clients where people really 
you get as much joy of kind of learning the challenges that your clients are facing and helping them as they have with working with you? Oh, I love my clients. I have learned so much in the, you know, I focused on my, the beginning of my career, I was on Wall Street and we did private equity. And we did all sorts of big deals all around the world. I couldn't re- tell you about any of them, but I'd be happy to tell you about the amazing people who, the high-end inter- interior designer who I work with, uh, the funeral home, who's my client, the wholesale florist who grows amazing plants and sells them throughout the region, the ar- architect who's doing amazing, beautiful homes here on Long Island. Like, I love getting to learn all these different industries and what's going on in them, what makes them tick, what's valuable to them, how can we best fix and help their legal needs. So that, to me, is just wonderful. And getting to be around other people who are doing the same thing, right? I tell them when they come and meet me, congratulations, you found someone who cares the same way you do about your business. I have a business, too. I know what it's like to have to make sure I make my numbers because, you know, that's how we continue to have a house and a home and, you know, clothes and food and all of that. So I get the pressure of running a business. Mm -hmm. You know, I get the pressure of finding clients. I get what it means to be different and how do you make it all work. So you're talking to someone who's just like you. I just happen to be running a business that's a law firm so I can help you with some of the things that you need for your business. And um, it works out really well. I think people connect because we're not here to tell them from on high what they need to do. Like, we have all the answers. No, how can we help? What can we do to make your business better so that you can work less, you know, less hard, right? So that you're not struggling, so that you don't feel like you're trying to figure it out. And so that's what, that's what we do. It's clear that you love your clients, and um, and I'm curious, like right now, what has you most inspired about your business and the clients that you work with? Oh, man, that's a wonderful question. I love getting the energy from them, seeing what they do. I have multiple clients right now that are out raising money for people to invest in their business and watching them think about their business. How can we be more attractive to clients? What can we do to to put pieces together better? I have a number of clients that are doing what you might call more public benefit companies where they're doing fair trade overseas, where they're making sure that living wages are being paid, where they're doing reliably sourced material and ethically and, and all of that. Talking to those entrepreneurs and what they're trying to do is really inspirational to see so many people trying to do so much good. I think today it's very easy to be cynical. I I hate having the news on in the background all day because it just can drag you down. And then I go out and I talk to my clients and I'm like, no, there's so much good in this world that's being done. And to get to be a part of it is terrific. Yeah, that's gotta, that's gotta lift you up for sure. I find that with the, the clients that I work with as well. It's like, People are trying to do good in the world, and I want to be surrounded by that at all times, especially yeah, because yeah. of you know the influx have, of, of what's coming at us through the news, right? Yeah, I have so many clients. You know, you hear terrible things about bosses. Mm-hmm. I have several clients that have gone out of their way to help their employees. You know, what can we do to help you? How can we, you know, a child sick, we're going to give them unlimited time off. We're going to make sure, you know, we're going to contribute to the child's uh, medical needs. Like incredible stories. They're, they're not on the, the news. They're not, never going to make it. And this is a small business. They can't, you know, it's not like they can quote unquote afford doing that, but they're decent people and they're helping their employees, their neighbors. It's, it's really incredible. Yeah. So Francine, we're going to go to a quick sponsorship break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more with you. Of course. Hey, all bosses, Rhodes Perry here. As you all know, part of my passion for this podcast is to empower you and fellow LGBT entrepreneurs to cultivate a feeling of purpose and belonging in your business, to know that you can show up and be the most authentic version of yourself. Purpose, belonging, and workplace culture are concepts I take seriously in my own consulting business. In fact, I'm on a mission to empower leaders just like you and those on their way to joining us to cultivate cultures of belonging. 
In my upcoming book, Belonging at Work, I share some of my personal struggles of coming out as a trans guy in the workplace and how I leverage this experience as one of my business superpowers. Now, I'm on a mission to support you in taking simple actions that will make a world of difference for anyone who has ever felt as if they needed to hide important aspects of themselves on the job. When you commit to purchasing a special, limited edition copy of the book, a portion of your purchase will support expanding workplace opportunities for fellow transgender and non-binary people. An added bonus, your story about what it means to belong at work will be featured on the book's website to inspire others. You're ready to belong at work now. To learn more, visit RhodesOnAmazon.com or text 444-999 and type the word belong. Again, that's RhodesOnAmazon.com or text 444-999 and type belong. Okay, so Francine, I wanted to pivot a bit and talk more about what brings you to the Rainbow family and specifically, you know, how being a part of the LGBT community shows up in business. With that, I wanted to kind of kick off this section of the interview to ask you if you can share with us a time where it was ever challenging for you to be 100% out in the workplace. And I'm imagining probably not in your law firm now, but working for other folks. If you can maybe share with us a story of something that was challenging and how you worked around it, I know that that will inspire many people who tune into the show and are still trying to negotiate how out they can be in their own businesses. Well, I I worked on Wall Street in the late 80s, early 90s, through the 10s. And Hmm. I can tell you that in the 90s, there were not many people out, including me for most of it. I was very circumspect about talking about anything I did outside of work. You know, everyone was just a friend or, you know, all, all of the code words that we use and, you know, not really talk about what's going on in our life. And then I forget what did it, but there was something on the news or, oh, I'm sorry, the Defense of Marriage Act. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's, what, That's a big one. <laughs> it, it hit me and I was offended. Mm-hmm. I was personally offended. And I said, the only way in my head, the only way I can get through to other people is if they understood that the me that they're talking about. I was well liked. I, you know, people enjoyed working with me. I did good work. This is me. And this is happening to me. I can't do things. And so I started I started putting my toe out a little and, and I remember I went out with one of my closest work friends and and she could tell that I and she's like, You look sick, are you okay? Is everything all right? And finally I said, Look, I gotta tell you, you know, I'm gay. I, I go out with girls, you know, I have a girlfriend. She said, oh, thank God, I thought you were going to tell me you were sick. <sighs> and then, yeah. you know, we ordered more food and had a great time. And it was such a relief. Yeah. Like, if she hadn't been that way, I don't know that I would have then had the courage to keep going, right? Yeah. But once she knew, well, then I told everyone in the department. And then a picture of my girlfriend, who later became my spouse, went up. And, and like, it just, then it became natural because I thought no one else who, anyone who's straight doesn't act like they, if they don't have coming out every day, oh, I'm straight, I'm going out with this guy. No, <laughs> yeah. they just have a picture, they talk, you know, they, they refer to going out and having a great date. So I started doing that, and I found that the more comfortable I became about it, the better it was for other people. You know, I have a good uh, bit of obliviousness to me. Sometimes my spouse jokes that I'll think everyone loves me and maybe not everyone does. But hey, it served me real well in my life so far, so I don't rock the boat too much on that. But, you know, why wouldn't someone be happy that I'm happy? And that's really how it worked for me. That's a great, thank you for sharing that story. I think it's really great. And as you were sharing it, you know, I was thinking, it's almost like you kind of won the jackpot and and coming out to the colleague that you did. And she was so cool with just like, oh, I, you know, I thought you were going to tell me something, you know, shocking, you know, this, like how how she normalized, like, cool, you have, you have a partner who's a woman. That's awesome. You know, I'm glad you're healthy. And then kind of moving on and, and that giving you courage then to think about how to, how to share really important part of who you are with your colleagues. You know, I think that goes to, trying to, and and maybe you were doing this intuitively or you were like, oh, this person has said something in the past that would suggest that she would be open, but just trying to find that kind of champion in the workplace who could be your ally or has the potential to be, 
I mean, that really that that really can make or break an office experience. And so I'm really happy to hear that 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 went so well for you. But just how scary that was, too, because you didn't know how she was going to react, even if she has said something positive in the past. And you were just you stood in your truth and you were able to share that. And I don't know if it ever gets easier, but the more you do it, it kind of maybe it desensitizes us to how challenging it can be. Of just right. you know this this very unique part of of being a part of the rainbow family where it's like we are straight yep. and cisgender until we share otherwise you know you know mm-hmm. sometimes you know those those assumptions that are made about who we are in the world so thank you for sharing no, that yeah. my spouse was telling me just last week that she feels like she has to come out nearly every day yeah. you know when you meet a new person or you mm-hmm. join a new group or you start a new activity yeah. And I had never thought of it that way. And, and that is something that's unique from our perspective is having to affirmatively declare that we're not straight or, you know, I, I agree, Rose. It's, it's an interesting thing, but thank God so many people now are friends and allies and accept and understand and it makes it so much better. Yes. But, uh, you know, I, I know people have had a really hard time and, and you know, that's terrible. It definitely is is a different world than it was in the days of the 80s and 90s. You know, I mean, with the the introduction of DOMA, I mean, that was that was a big mm-hmm. <laughs> that was intense. You know, and it was a, a yeah. scary time. It was a scary time just to be out, right? And I mean, mm-hmm. it, it can be scary now too. You know, but you're right in that it does feel like we have more friends. There's there's more awareness out in the world. A lot of the myths about our communities um, continue to be dispelled in really creative ways. And thankfully the internet is there, you know, YouTube is, is doing a good job yeah. of putting out good content. And also like what you did, you know, by coming out to your colleague when you did, and you already had a strong relationship with her, you know, she, she probably respected your work and appreciated your, the team morale that you brought. And that too really is, is the, in my opinion, I think the foundation of, of changing hearts and minds or just bringing in more people to share a different perspective on the world. And I always share the statistic, but I think it's still really compelling. You know, for me, I'm a trans guy. And like 10 years ago, something like 8% of adults in the United States knew someone who was trans or worked with someone who was trans. And that number kind of doubled (laughs) to like 16% 10 years later, but still so low. You know what I mean? So until Mm -hmm. more of us, and you know, and I, I get there's privilege and feeling safe and there's a ton of reasons why it's it's still really challenging to come out or just to be visibly trans. But I think if you are in a position, you know, and this is more broadly for all of us in the Rainbow family, to kind of share your truth with more people, that alone is transformative, right? Because people already know you. They already have relationships with you. I'm getting the sense, this is the first time we're talking, but I'm getting a sense you're a great person, right? And, and I think that that's just another dimension of who you are. And I do think that with with those relationships that you've had with people in the past, it just, it allows people to kind of re-examine some of maybe their own unconscious biases. And it's not a static thing (laughs) coming out. And um, the more that we do it, I mean, I think over time too, it's like, oh, I have to do this again. (laughs) But that moment, you know, if you, if you can stand in your truth and just do it, it really can just change people's minds. And it's, it's interesting when it's received well, right. Of just like, watching that happen for another person and just to be like, oh, okay, cool. You know, and it, I think it's powerful. It's a very powerful thing and so simple. It is. And also so scary, right? Because a, a lot of people are not in a place where they can feel safe to do that and it could compromise their jobs. So with that, I'm going to kind of move to something that's a little more uplifting, <laughs> which is I think because of this unique experience of coming out and just uh, the lived experiences that we have from being a part of the Rainbow family, we gain a lot of strengths. And so I'm wondering with your own experiences of being a part of the LGBT community, do you see yourself at having some kind of superpowers in business because of these lived experiences? And if so, what, what are some? I think that being part of, of the Rainbow family, I like how you phrase it, Rhodes, so I'm going to begin using that, does allow us, I think, a bit more empathy than perhaps some other people may have. And by that, I mean, we've had to pick up on cues, especially before we could be more out than we were, you know, oh, okay, I I pick up on that more subtle cue about that you're giving me that we might 
closer together than than we are far apart, right? You're part of the same community I am. I get that. You know, the coded language we've had to adopt in the past. And I think that has allowed me to be able to read people better, uh, to be more empathetic. I certainly, you know, having had our my own struggle and, and coming out and being out and now there's just no doubt. If you come to my law firm, you're going to know that I'm married to a woman, that we have two children, you know, we've adopted them. It's transracial adoptions, uh, you know, so we definitely are a beautiful family, right? And so I think because of that, there's more empathy, there's more willingness to be inclusive and diverse. We're willing to take a chance on things that perhaps haven't been done. And I think, Rose, you made me think of this a moment ago when you were talking about when we come out over and over again and in your experience as a trans man, that we were built to be entrepreneurs in many ways, actually, because we know the feeling of, yeah, <laughs> and, and the terror and the excitement and the, and the unique potential that comes. If anyone's built for the, the life of an entrepreneur, I think it's the uh, people in, in the Rainbow family. Yes, I completely agree with that. It's so interesting that you said that. And, you know, at the time of this recording, it's the month of March. On the 31st, it's a Trans Day of Visibility. And a couple of years ago, when I was first getting started in business, I wrote this piece that's talking about the similarities of, you know, in this instance, you know, being a trans person, but then also, you know, just like the parallels of being an entrepreneur, you know, so like the things that you were saying about taking a risk and, you know, when you're transitioning, you are being the architect of your own life. When you're coming out as LGBT more broadly, you're you're taking control of your life in that narrative. And so the things that people thought you ought to do, the expectations that your parents may have had about who you were going to marry and what your family would look like, you reclaim all of that in a way that that is that mm-hmm. becomes yours. You become self-actualized really fast. And sometimes when you come out, you may not know about what that will be of like how self-actualized you will become because you you get tested, right? And I think that mm-hmm. similarly, you know, when you break out of this kind of mindset of being an employee for someone else, like you said earlier, building someone else's wealth, you say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try this for myself. It, there's just so many parallels to that, you know, so... I mean, that's something mm-hmm. I'll, I'll share on uh, the Out Entrepreneur and the notes of just that, that article that I wrote. But yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you, you know, where it's both terrifying, you know, to start out as, as being an entrepreneur. And then there's, there's a lot of rewards to that. And similarly, like when you're coming out, there's a lot of similar emotions. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love what you shared. And um, yeah, and on the piece of empathy, too, is just knowing what it's like to feel different, knowing what it's like to feel sometimes radically excluded, it almost motivates us Mm -hmm. more to be curious about, okay, I have felt this before. How might I be perpetuating these kind of behaviors for other folks that I'm working with or my clients? And how might I be able to change that? How can I gain some awareness? And yeah, I think that because of our experiences, not everybody, but a lot of us kind of lean into that and try to think, think about the world in different ways. So yeah, I think there's a lot of superpowers and and thank you for sharing so many of your Mm -hmm. own. I'm really glad that you're in business, <laughs> um, embracing them and doing good work. For our audience, oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. For our audience, um, you know, considering some of these challenges that we talked about, you know, specifically with coming out, and then all of these superpowers, you know, that kind of balance out sometimes the harder, harder parts of being in the Rainbow Family. You know, what do you want our listeners to take away to inspire them to be more authentic in their own work, whether they're working for someone else or um, they're just getting started in their business or they've been running their businesses for a long time? Well, I think that people are dying literally to to work with someone that they know, like, and trust, right? That's that's who people want to do business with. And how do you get to know someone? Well, it's by being open about things in life, right? How do you know and like them? How do you trust them? It's because you can see more of them and understand them. Now, I'm not naive. The reason why people should hire me is because I'm an excellent attorney, and I know my stuff, and I'm going to provide the best legal services I possibly can to them. But that's the basic, right? Anyone who's offering a service, 
Um, no one comes to you because they think you're going to be a mediocre consultant, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to find someone who's kind of a terrible coach and, you know, hope for the best. <laughs> right. you know, they don't do that, right? right? They come expecting expertise. So then what can you do on top of the expertise, right, to make it a, a, a relationship that continues on, where they keep coming back, for services, where they refer their friends and family to you. Well, that's the like, like, know, and trust value. And so for me, one of the things I do every month is I send out a printed newsletter, not an e-newsletter, because if you're like me, and I'm sure you are, you get, what, <laughs> 500 <many>. emails a yes. day? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it feels some days that 400 of them, 400 of them are other people's e-newsletters, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They go in the garbage, you know, they go right into the e-trash yeah. because I don't have time to clutter up mail email boxes. But I print a physical newsletter and I put a stamp on it and I mail it to all of my clients and to friends of the firm. And in it, I talk about all sorts of things that apply to life and running a business and, and very little about legal issues. Because I can't give legal advice. I can't give legal advice on this program. I can't give legal advice in a newsletter. You know, I have to be working with you to give legal advice. But my newsletter lets people get to know me, get yep. to see my kid, get to see my family, get to hear about what we're doing. It gives business tips that have nothing to do with law, but how to be safe, how to get your payments collected from other people, how to improve your LinkedIn profile. And so I try and do things that build value for my clients and my friends so that when they think about me and my firm, I'm not just that lawyer, but I'm the lawyer who's helping them with their business. I'm the lawyer who's connecting them to good services. I'm the lawyer who knows, you know, five great accountants and can set them up with a CPA that's going to mesh well with their personality and the way they handle things and, you know, take care of them right. I know a great financial planner. So I've become a resource, a hub for people. And to me, that's what people are longing for. They want community. They want inclusiveness. They want to feel welcome and wanted. You know, I think back to that old sitcom Cheers and, you know, where everyone knows your name and you walk in and it's like, hey, Norm. <laughs> so it's, people want to be part of a group, yeah. to be part of this tribe, something that means something. My law firm tries to offer that. You become beloved. You become part of our family. You become part of our whole network. And we all want to work with you and make you do well. I think that's what people are longing for. You have to be good at what you do. Otherwise, don't be an entrepreneur, right? Yes. You know, make the best product, do the right service, be awesome. But then it's that extra value that will really set your business on fire. Yeah. Be awesome and also still be human, be a person, you know, and, and show kind of your yeah. full dimension. You know, kudos to you for printing a newsletter. <laughs> like, I, I know of only a handful of other entrepreneurs that do that or business owners. And wow, I mean, it does make an impression. And I mean, me personally, if I get something in the snail mail, <laughs> you know, that is not a mm -hmm. bill or, you know, some junk mail, it's like something from someone that I know. It's a treasure, right? I mean, I feel like it's almost kind of like this yeah. lost art. So good on you for that. Francine, I have two more questions for you. The first is, I know that in, in the bio, I had mentioned that you're also the ED, the founder of a business alliance in Long Island. I, I'm curious, you know, I, I usually ask this question in a way, I mean, it sounds like you're very engaged in community and kind of building off of that. Is, is there an additional way that you you work to to give back to LGBT community specifically? Is that kind of stitched into the business alliance that you've built? Or are there other ways that you give back to communities that could really benefit from a business like yours? So the Long Island Business Forum is a collection of about 30 different businesses. Uh, there are some other um, LGBTQ members in it, but it's not focused solely on, on the Rainbow family. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is focused on helping small businesses thrive and be incredible. We do events to try and help better things in, in our local community. And my own law firm, we have sponsored um, a fundraising drive at the end of the year for different families uh, the last several years, focusing 
on people who are in more marginalized communities. Not all have been LGBTQ by any means, but we, we've been trying to focus on, uh, on more social justice. We also look at a lot of racial issues because I, I have two children who are of color. And so I have never been more aware of the, of the disparities uh, that they face as they go through their journey. And my own concern for my son in particular as a young man of color and, you know, so many people think he's adorable right now. Well, he's four. And, you know, okay, what will you think of him when he's 12 Mm -hmm. and 16 and 20 and 25? And am I going to get to see my son safe and grow up? And so those are the type of things that, you know, my firm uh, spends a lot of time thinking about is, you know, how can we help uh, anyone in, in communities that have been threatened by ignorance? And so we really work hard to combat that. I love that. When I was reading about the alliance, you know, I mean, it was just kind of a couple sentences and I was like, I bet there's something in here where you're where you're giving back to communities through either pro bono legal work and, you know, the fact that you're kind of centering that, that work around social justice, around racial equity and kind of the intersections with LGBT communities where that touches, that's so needed. And, you know, local businesses can be so powerful in shaping, you know, local public policy and influencing systems that maybe aren't so great, you know? So I I love that you're doing that and that you're doing that, not just in Long Island, but the greater New York City metro region. I mean, that's powerful. So keep at it, keep going. So my last question for you, Francine, is considering that there are some folks tuning in that are just thinking about getting started as an entrepreneur, what would be just one piece of advice to inspire them to take that first entrepreneurial leap? Oh, uh, do it. Um, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> Nike ad, just do it. Yeah. Um, look, it's terrifying. It takes everything. It'll be, you'll have sleepless nights, you'll have days where you'll be knit up with anxiety. But if it's something that you feel passionate about and you're willing to do the hard work, right? You, you know, Rose, you don't have a successful business without working hard. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a myth to say that it's all going to come easy. Mm -hmm. But if you're willing to work hard and you're willing to focus on filling a need that people have and really think about, you know, how can I be of benefit to my community, to the people around me? How can I make things better, right? You know, either by providing great legal services or providing great consulting or by helping someone, you know, learn something new or by providing a product that makes things better. But whatever you do, it fills a hole that people have. Um, then then you got it. And the, the other thing I say is to find people who are like you, who are trying to do it. The, the group I run, the LIBF, we meet monthly. Like I said, we have about 30 businesses and we have it very much a mastermind mentality. We get together for an hour and a half and I get, have lots of questions that probe and say, you know, what can you do better? How can we be different? How can we make things better for our clients? How can we raise our rates? How can we uh, do better on marketing? You know, we ask lots of questions and get everyone contributing so that we can learn from one another. And I've been more inspired by being around those women and what they're doing than really any other group of people because they are out trying to make it happen every single day. And I respect that so much. Yes. And and I want yeah. to learn from it. Yes. So just do it. Do the work. <laughs> work hard and yep. be great at what you do. I mean, I think that that's... I mean, if we just played that clip over and over again, <laughs> when we when we all get stuck wherever we are in our entrepreneurial journeys, you know, that's that's really great advice, Francine. So I appreciate that. I appreciate your time. I know you're busy. So thank you for, for being on the show. Where can we... Thank you for the invite. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. What is the best place to find you online? That one single place. <laughs> uh, well, be sure. My website is probably the best. Love Law Firm, and then the letters P L L C dot com. I have videos, I have blogs, I have articles. Sign up for my newsletter there. You can sign. You can get. I have several eBooks about how to pick a business attorney, how to four things that you need to know to have a successful business. 
I have a lot of resources there. And if people go there, it'll take you to my YouTube channel. You can follow me then on Facebook and all sorts of ways. But there's a lot of information at my website. And um, people are welcome to come and, and engage with me. I love to hear from people. Very cool. So we will include that in the show notes. So thank you again, Francine. Thank you. This has been awesome. For Outbosses, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode. It is always my privilege to connect with you and so many inspiring outbosses like Francine. So for details from today's conversation, to find out all of those great resources that Francine just mentioned, go over to outentrepreneur.com and you will find all of those awesome resources there. So if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, consider going over to iTunes or wherever you consume podcasts. And go ahead and and be a, a weekly subscriber. Check out the show. And if you like what we're talking about, what you're learning, please leave a rating and review there in iTunes. So for now, keep being your authentic selves 100% of the time. <laughs>